Good morning. All right, how about it? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Philadelphia. Welcome, welcome to the University of Pennsylvania, the School of Design, and this extraordinary meeting. My name is Marilyn Taylor. I'm the Dean of the School of Design, a lifelong architect and urban designer, absolutely delighted to be among your company today. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here and to announce that this wonderful gathering of friends and colleagues who constitute the Landscape Arch Architecture Foundation is now coming to order for the first of our two days here together. How many of you are from Philadelphia? How many of you ever lived in Philadelphia? How many of you want to live in Philadelphia? Come and join us. We'd be delighted to have you. Philadelphia is an amazing city. Uh, I gave up New York City to come here eight years ago, and I could not be happier about that decision. I do hope that even with this agenda that you have, you'll take some time to explore it. One point very relevant to our discussions today is how literally green, blue, and brown Philadelphia is. Our city encompasses approximately 84,000 acres. Over one-ninth, 9,000 of those, are the Fairmont Park System, and another one-ninth are our industrial lands, most of them fallow and ready for new uses. Those two elements are indications of the great future that lies ahead for our city. Thank you, President Kona Gray, Executive Director Barbara Deutsch, and members of the LAF Board for accepting Richard Weller's invitation to come to Philadelphia this year. Together, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Concerns set forth with high expectations and determination by Ian McHarg and his band of colleagues. Standing here, and especially if you look up, it seems appropriate for an architect to take one moment for another field of design, architecture. We find ourselves in this curious ceremonial room and this curious monumental building designed by Philadelphia architect Horace Trumbauer in the 1920s. It was a high time of civic culture here in Philadelphia. Trumbauer's chief architect was Julian Abele, an African-American who regrettably was never given the public credit he surely deserved for the many works of the Trumbauer firm. Irvine Auditorium itself is said to demonstrate the persistence of collegiate Gothic style. It was 1920, we were moving on to other styles at that time. But it clearly felt the challenge of responding to its idiosyncratic neighbor, the extraordinary modern library designed four decades earlier in splendid Venetian Gothic style with more than a touch of the Victorian by our famous original architect, Frank Furness. Today, our amazing architectural archives occupy its ground floor, making the works of Kahn, Venturi Scott Brown, and Halperin, among others, available to scholars and to curious members of the public as well. Just a few thoughts. Philadelphia is a collaborative city. Interestingly enough, it was the Furness Library that bought, brought Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown together. They were both on the Penn Design faculty sometime in the 60s when the subject of an imminent proposal to demolish the Furnace Library came up for discussion. Alone among those attending, Denise flew to the defense of the building. Afterwards, Bob came up to say that she was right. Typically, rather than accepting the compliment, she turned to him and said, then why didn't you speak up too? In such meetings as these, partnerships and collaborations that change the world are born. Speaking up for Venturi Scott Brown, as for Ian McCarg, becomes important. So too, for all of us, if we do not speak up, who will? And speaking of Venetian Gothic, I just returned from Venice, from the opening of the Architecture Biennale, a show about speaking up. As we all know, it takes place in a garden and in an arsenal in one of the world's most beautiful and precarious cities. This year's show is curated by the Chilean architect, who was also recently named the Pritzker Prize winner, Alejandra Aravena. His theme is reporting from the front, something I think we should keep in mind as we spend these two days together. While we can speculate what he means by that charge, it is clearly his call to architects 
And I could say to designers to engage in the tremendous and challenging social issues of our times growing demand for city life, massive destabilizing migrations, scarce resources, threats of wind, water, and fire, and the need to reach greater equity in opportunity, education, and quality of life. To put myself in the mind of Italy at the age of Venetian power, power, power I found myself on a plane reading a marvelous book by Helen Attlee, The Land Where Lemons Grow, the story of Italy and its citrus fruit it was a gift. I thought maybe it was a travelogue or some sort of simple history. But in fact, it's an extraordinary story of the Arabs who, Arabs who brought citrus to Sicily and of the ways in which wealthy and curious 16th and 17th century Italians tried to match their passion for gardens with a scientific interest in not only the cultivation of lemons, but also the huge variety of hybrids that could easily be created. In her book, Atlee quotes Galileo. I put it up here because it's a very complex structure and a wonderful idea. If there were as great a scarcity of soil as of jewels or precious metals, there wouldn't be a prince who would not spend a bushel of diamonds and rubies and a cartload of gold just to have enough earth to sow an orange seed and watch it sprout, grow and produce its handsome leaves, its fragrant flowers, and fine fruit. Landscape architecture might just come again to celebrate soil, citrus, and our responsibility for the cultivation of knowledge, and to face the challenges of where and how we will live as water intrudes and covers the soil that supports our places of living and working. Whether we are in Venice or Philadelphia, or at home or on site, wherever that is, we as designers must seek better ways to value the ecological assets essential to our individual and collective lives and well-being. We will not succeed without fresh thinking on cities and human settlements. They are the venues w through which we will achieve greater social equity or not. We cannot shrink with responsibility from responsibility for the urban. And we cannot expect to do it alone. Science is our friend and our ally. But we also need to include, to integrate in our thinking, all the principles that we can learn and gain and the information we get from sociology, from social science, the integration of our landscape with the values and qualities of each distinctive community, with an understanding of what it takes to face risk, overcome deficiencies, and commit to inhabiting land or to making a choice to inhabit land nearby. Cities and settlements, environmental degradations and politically driven migrations, soil and water, design thinking and collaborations, these are some of the critical pieces of this century's declaration of concern. Thank you very much for being here with us. I really look forward to hearing from all of you. Have a great day. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to bring to the other podium, Kona Gray, the president of the Landscape Architects Foundation. Welcome to the podium. Good morning. I said good morning. All right, fantastic. So on behalf of the LAF Board of Directors, the Board of Emeritus, and our wonderful staff, we would love to welcome you to this historic event. We are so excited about this. You guys have exceeded our ex expectations. First and foremost, we need to thank some people who have made this possible. Love to be here and announce to you guys our thankfulness to Penn, especially, for their hospitality, their gracious and kind support, and all their dedication to this profession. So Marilyn, Richard, and all the landscape architects at Penn Design, thank you so much for all your efforts. I'd like to thank our board of directors, because without your big thinking and audacity, we wouldn't be here today. The board members, please stand. Thank you so much.
So as a nonprofit, the Landscape Architecture Foundation receives support from many people, um, industry partners, landscape architecture firms, universities, and individuals. We're so thankful and so grateful for your attention to our cause and our mission. So I'd like to thank our supporters. And tomorrow night, there will be more opportunity for you to see how you can get involved with the LAF as well. Thank you. So, you may be wondering how we all got here. So we started about a year ago uh, planning this event. We knew we had to do something for our 50th year. We didn't know what it was gonna be. But I remember the mid-year meeting when it all started to gel. And that's when Richard Weller stepped up and said, okay, I'll take this on. And it's been quite a ride. We initially expected to only have about 300 people in attendance. We have over 715 people that have registered and are attending this event, so kudos to you. So in the spirit of envisioning the future, um, you may note that we have assembled an amazing group of designers, environmentalists, landscape architects from all over the world. And this is a map of the United States to show where everyone is coming from. So it's pretty intriguing. Years and years ago in 1966, it was all about the American landscape. That was our concern. Things have changed. Now we are interested in the global landscape, the things we can do to affect the capacity of landscape architects to help to preserve, enhance, and improve the environment. There were only six men, white men to be exact, that started the declaration back in 1966. How cool is it that there's over 715 people here today to be a part of this process over the next couple of days to the weekend? We're extremely excited and we're impressed. I mean, this is a who's who of landscape architects and the audience that has joined us is exceptional and we are so excited for your support and your interest in our common environment as well. So how about that? Let's get started, right? You guys pumped up? You ready to go? All right. It's very exciting times. So as I said before, 1966 it was about the American landscape. All right, think bigger now. We're talking about the global landscape. We're talking about our environment. We are all intertwined now. It's very amazing. You know, they used to say when the US catches a cold, the rest of the world sneezes. It's different now. We're all together as one. So we really want you to think bold. We want you to be provocative. We want you to be excited. We want you to challenge us. We want you to be critical. This is not about kumbaya and everybody having fun. This is about challenging the status quo. We're gonna talk about everything from the urban ecology, diversity, the landscape architecture practice, things that are happening in our world that affect all of us. So once again, thank you so much for all your hard work. We have amazing speakers that have spent a lot of time preparing for this event. Um, they're very excited to show you what they are thinking about and express their thought leadership. And we're excited to hear from you. We are here to shape the future and we want all of you to have a voice in that process. Thank you so much. So now, to give you the lay of the land, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Barbara Deitch. Wow, this is totally awesome. <laughs> We've been working so hard for this and so appreciate you taking your time out of your work, out of your personal time tomorrow to be here and be a part of this, and um, uh, we're really looking forward to the next two days. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about actually what you're, the work you're gonna be doing in the next two days. Um, we wanted to bring, when we were thinking about our 50 year anniversary and, and what to do and how to mark this historic occasion and recognizing the needs in the world today, 
uh, we wanted to bring the, professional, the profession together to really um, uh, get, get ourselves organized and uh, planned so we can make the most of this, uh, of our um, uh, uh, limited number to uh, make the most change. Because we do feel that this is, um, this is our time. Uh, if there is the age of engineering and then there is the age of architecture, uh, this is the age of landscape architecture to meet the needs, uh, the complex uh, environmental, social, economic needs of today, the issues that we have. And uh, we think there is a global shift in consciousness taking place, even if it's not here politically in the U.S., but uh, from Paris to the Pope to even the Prime Minister in Canada, uh, the support for uh, thinking, yes, it's time, we need to do something. Uh, so. We know that the good fairy doesn't just tap you on the shoulder and all of a sudden it happens and all of a sudden it's the age of landscape architecture. And that's why we're here, to uh, get organized and uh, figure out how to make the most of our limited number and uh, make our vital contribution. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, 50 years ago, the rivers were on fire. Uh, they were septic, the air was polluted, um, development was unchecked. Uh, a lot of those things are still happening in other places of the world and even here. Um, but there, was, there were people that spoke up and made a difference. And certainly that era of activism, whether it was environmental activism or civil rights movement, uh, made a difference. It provided this framework for, uh, uh, the, to protect our resources that got us this far. And uh, certainly this image is it goes way back, but this is the first Earth Day in 1970. 22 million people around the country gathered to celebrate the Earth. It was uh, here, this is Fairmont Park in Philadelphia, so we are in a special place coming back here to reconvene and figure out how to move forward. Uh, and at this time, all this legislation, unbelievable. Can you imagine getting this done today here in the U.S.? Uh, but 10 years, <laughs> 10 years of, of work from this activism, people were active. Uh, and they were dealing with uh, things that maybe toxic substances and things that we can see. And now we know we're dealing with um, some things we can't always see. Carbon emissions, uh, stormwater pollution. Um, but we can see the effects, uh, species extinction, uh, all the cultural anxiety at large that we all experience. And a world in which uh, new generations today don't even know that weather used to be more regular and predictable and steady and constant. So we are dealing with these issues of global warming and climate change, adaptation. Uh, uh, there are 7.4 billion people on this planet now. 50 years ago, there were 3 billion. So we've more than doubled that in 50 years. And all those people need a place to live, work, rest, and play. And that's where uh, we come in, right? So right now, we're operating at an ecological footprint of 1.5 planets worth of resources. We're out of planets, that's not sustainable in it by any definition. But this is uh, where we come in because with any of these issues, no matter how you define sustainability, whether it's zero carbon, zero waste, net zero water, biodiversity, livability, health and happiness, you cannot achieve any of them without considering landscape. And so the question is, are we fully participating to our greatest potential uh, to influence and assert the landscape perspective assert the landscape approach, and uh, make sure we implement sustainable landscape solutions. So that is why uh, we're here today, and we appreciate so much you participating, because we need to be smart, we need to be strategic. There aren't as many landscape architects as there are uh, architects or uh, civil engineers. And um, uh, so, as I said, we need to be smart and strategic, and the good news is we are. So uh, we just need to get organized. Because when research shows that uh, although th things are much easier to influence when you have a majority or even parity, uh, minority interests have influence at or, at or above 20% level. So uh, yes, wouldn't the world look differently today if we had over 200,000 landscape architects here in the US? I know in China they're having a lot of landscape architects, uh, 40,000 graduates a year. But um, we uh, shouldn't wait to, uh, to, to not make our contribution and, because there's a limited number of us. And so we should still strive to grow the profession. While we're doing that, we, um, we can't 
We can't wait. We just need to be emboldened to show that in the meantime, we can still influence and lead, and that is why we're here. You're going to hear a lot about, well, you've already heard a lot about the Declaration of Concern, this founding. This is the first initiative of LAF to get together um, uh, to chart its strategy to increase the capacity of the profession um, and forms, forms the basis for the uh, Landscape Architecture Foundation. Over the next two days, we're um, uh, going to uh, respond to this, and, and the objective is, is to develop a new landscape declaration. Uh, and this is where we're getting this conversation and strategy started. So uh, if you look at the uh, declaration, uh, and hopefully you've all read it, and if you had it, you're going you're to hear about it, and it's always good to read again. Um, but the way it's um, organized into three conceptual areas. The first part talks about the current issues or the environmental crisis. The second part talks about the uh, agency or the role of landscape architects to help solve the environmental crisis. And then the, th the final part uh, are the strategies to help landscape architects make their vital contribution to solve the environmental crisis. So our job here in the next two days is to update this uh, declaration. We're going to get the inputs uh, from it through a series of um, uh, speakers today, kind of like a day of TED Talks, uh, with over 25 declarations responding to this declaration of concern and offering their vision for the future. Uh, we'll hear um, from, uh, with a closing panel, kind of start to pull all this together. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow we have curated panels, both in, um, by content and uh, types of practice, to respond to what is said today, and then um, start to develop the strategies and uh, priorities from which we'll take the outputs from this two-day summit to draft the, uh, as the inputs to the new uh, landscape declaration. And, um, uh, and then I'll, I'll tell you what's next in terms of where we're going to finalize it with, uh, with your help. Uh, but I do want to say this is, an, we all know this is a very ambitious format, but uh, and as such it inherently is not perfect, but it's, uh, we wanted to see how far we could get, and we certainly want to keep the bar high, and um, we want to make the most of this moment in time. So thank you again for being here, part of it. We know that, uh, uh, thankfully, there are way more leaders in the profession who could not be here, but we have over 700 people here, uh, totally exceeding our expectations. Um, and, and we're going to work with you through different ways to get your input and engage in this conversation. And please be provocative and incisive and um, tweet in your questions and answer the polls and write down. I hope you all saw those declare cards. Uh, make sure your voice is heard. Um, but uh, we know that not every geographic area is or could possibly be represented here. And we know we don't look like the face of America, and, um, but we're, we're, we decided to adopt the Buddhist mantra to just start where we are, right? Because if we wait till it's perfect, it's too late. So we have an amazing asset here with all of you and a venue to really um, get this ball rolling and start this conversation and action plan. Oh, I forgot to say that after tomorrow, we will summarize, there's going to be a lot going on, so we'll try to summarize some of the key outputs that have come out of this event, um, this two days, and then we will make a toast to the future. Okay, and then after the toast, what will uh, the, the next step game plan uh, to draft the new landscape decoration is uh, we'll take all the input, uh, LAF will lead a task force to, to draft the new landscape decoration, and we'll put it out for a public comment period, and there'll be lots of different ways to give your input. Uh, and then we uh, will have the final draft at the annual meeting in New Orleans and at our LAF Expo booth. Uh, everyone can come by and sign it. So instead of six signatures 50 years ago, we will have hundreds of people who are part of this process uh, helping to position the profession for the next 10, 20, 50 years to meet the demands of today. Uh, and then once we have the new declaration, we're also going to be looking to work, uh, get organized and collaboratively and cooperatively with other, with you, with you, with other organizations, um, both within and outside the profession, uh, who we will work with, right? We made a conscious choice to just bring in the profession. It went against every collaborative bone in our body just to have landscape architects here, but we figure we need to get 
uh, organized internally before we can uh, strengthen the way we're going out and working with others to uh, uh, help make a difference. So um, we will yeah, work on the action plans, the implementation, and we don't plan on waiting another 50 years before we come back together. We'll come back in five years, 10 years to help look at how are we tracking to the goals that we want to achieve, and so we can um, adapt, improve, and, and achieve those goals. This new declaration is also part of a larger context, a deliberate process, uh, whereby we're working uh, at a global scale. Um, I think when you look at the declaration, uh, that's a key thing. It was specifically talking about the American landscape, but as you'll hear today, uh, you know, we live in a global world. And uh, so the output from the new landscape declaration will form the input also for IFLA to take to the World Design Summit in a year and a half in Montreal, uh, where it's not just landscape architects, but other designers. The, uh, IFLA was one of the three founding partners with um, uh, uh, planners, architects, graphic designers, um, industrial designers, and interior designers to um, come together uh, to um, try to give uh, an economic voice or power to design and uh, political influence. So, so the input we have will be represented by IFLA at the summit. Okay. And uh, I should say that other, other countries have formed their charters and declarations, and so this is perfect timing for uh, the United States and all of you here to contribute to that to also a global uh, perspective of uh, the, the profession and our contribution. So lots ahead, and this was a very deliberate process, but um, wanted to also acknowledge and recognize the uh, invaluable benefits of, of being here, of um, meeting with your colleagues and friends, uh, having fun, uh, learning, sharing, um, and putting all of our individual interests aside and coming together to build something larger than ourselves for the betterment of all. So uh, it's fun, and we really appreciate you being here, and uh, thank you for committing to this journey.